Welcome to the Bard Graduate Center Gallery. My name is Rachel, and I'll be sharing with you our exhibition, Eileen Gray. Here at BGC, we study the lives of objects and the stories that they tell us. Eileen Gray was born in 1878 to an affluent family in Ireland. Her wealth enabled her to pursue her artistic interests. At 22, she studied at the Slade School of Art in London, and in 1902, she moved to Paris to continue her artistic training. Early on in her career, Eileen Gray moved from 2D to 3D forms. She began with watercolors at the Slade School of Art, then she moved into lacquer work, studying with a conservator in London. When she moved to Paris, she began designing entire interiors, complete with her modernist rugs, tables, and chairs. Eventually, she began designing homes and socially-minded architectural projects. Throughout her career, Eileen Gray drew inspiration from her various collaborators. She worked with Evelyn Wilde on carpet weaving, Seizo Sugawara on Japanese lacquer work, and finally, she worked with Jean Badovici on architectural projects. As we move through the exhibition together today, let's keep in mind this question. How might form and material bring an object to life? In 1909, Eileen Gray opened two workshops in Paris, one for carpet weaving and one for lacquer work. Eileen Gray's early patterns reflect her digesting the movements of her time, constructivism, cubism, and futurism. Eileen Gray initially would make her drawings on gouache or using collage, and then would transfer her drawings to graph paper with thread samples. Her early rugs were made using a tapestry weave, meaning that they were woven from the back and each weft corresponded to a color in the pattern. In 1922, Eileen Gray opened her gallery Jean Dessert in Paris, France. It provided a platform for her to experiment and share new kinds of materials, such as ostrich feathers, lacquer work, metal, pashmina, zebra skin. The spirit of her experimentation is really captured in her bibendum chair. And the bibendum chair, it was really inspired by the 1898 bibendum character. And I think Eileen Gray captures the friendliness of that character in her chair. Let's imagine together what it would feel like to sit in this chair. You'd probably sit kind of low to the ground on those small tubular feet with your arms raised on those big tubular arms, those cushy arms, almost like the chair is wrapping you in a great big hug. What do you think it would feel like to sit in this chair? I really think that Eileen Gray treats her objects and her furniture like they're co-workers, meaning that they are working together in harmony with the environments that she creates. Gray's interest in screens developed in tandem with her interest in lacquer work. Behind me is an example of one of her black brick screens created in 1918. This screen is actually an unfinished prototype, but this allows us to see how her screen is put together. At the very top level, you'll notice that there's some small pegs, which gives us a clue as to the way that each brick was slotted together just like a puzzle. Imagine living with one of Gray's screens. We're aided by photographs of several black brick screens that she designed for the apartment of the milliner Juliet Levy. In a photograph, Levy strikes a pose and her entryway vibrates with the dynamism that Gray's screens provide. Some of that movement is still captured today in our gallery through the interplay of light and shadow cast on our gallery walls. E1027 is a tribute to the collaboration between Eileen Gray and Jean Badovici. Built in 1926, the house is perched on a seaside cliff 
in Roquebrune Cap Martin in France. The name of the house, E1027, is symbolic of its two creators, E for Eileen, 10 for J, 2 for B, and 7 for G. Although they built this house together, it was solely intended to be used by Vadovici. Let's take a closer look at one of the chairs that Eileen Gray designed for E1027. One of the first things that you might notice about this chair is its asymmetry. It has two different arms, one at a right angle and one at an oblique slant. This chair was built to socialize. Its sitter could sit down and reach behind them or talk to someone over their shoulder, all the while resting their arm with a cigarette on the oblique slant. Gray built her private villa, Tempe Apaya, in Menton, France between 1931 and 1934 as a place of isolation and retreat. The house's modest dimensions meant that Gray calibrated her home to suit all of her needs and her way of living. This cabinet with pivoting drawers epitomizes the way that Gray designs and builds objects for her own ways of living and interacting. Gray's cabinet is multifunctional. It is both a tabletop and a cabinet with drawers. In our gallery, we have it displayed with all of its drawers open, but when the drawers are closed and when you're looking at the tabletop from above, the glass surface renders the object totally transparent. Like Gray's non-conformist chair, her cabinet with pivoting drawers is asymmetrical. It has two distinctive feet because one side opened into an adjoining room that was at a different level. Gray took issue with the designer architect Le Corbusier's theory of a machine for living. She instead proposed that a house was, quote, the shell of man, his extension, his spiritual emanation. I'd like to leave us with one last question to think about. Eileen Gray's architectural projects and her furniture have me thinking about my own living spaces. Would you identify your own living space as a machine for living, an extension of yourself, or a combination of both?